few mackerel. Every fishing trip, it seems, starts with getting the bait. It's most important, isn't it? But this time of year, especially in South Devon, where we are today, there's plenty of mackerel around, but sometimes it takes a bit of time. We've had a, we've had a couple of other spots where we haven't had a fish, but you now, what nice mackerel they are. They make nice fillets. Get a nice size off of those shortly. But we've also got some sand eel to use as well, so between the two, we should catch a few fish today. So never be afraid to spend a bit of time getting bait. Even if it takes half an hour or even an hour, it's time well spent. Now when you prepare your bait, you need to be neat and fussy because I, I think that fish are fussy as well. Now, you wouldn't like to have a meal that was not prepared properly. So take your fillet off using a shark knife, nice and cleanly. Clean off the, the gunge. If you get a mackerel that's thick, take off, take off some of the flesh You don't want it too thick when it's in the water. Providing it's not too thick, then it flaps nicely. Now, there's lots of ways you can cut mackerel. You can cut it like that, so you get a, like pieces like that. You can cut it that way. You can cut it long ways. Or you can just square it up and use long ways like we were using today, in which case, if you want to do that, take away the, the belly, and you can square up a piece off the side, keeping it nice and square. I usually take that off, some do and some don't. I have seen some anglers take pieces off the corner, but I'm quite happy myself to use it like that. Important thing at the beginning of the day, of course, is, trying, is preparation, as I've said, about getting mackerel. And that's getting the rubby dubby ready. Not a lot of people use rubby dubby, but if more did, I feel sure that they would have more success. It's always a dirty, filthy job, but Adrian's used to this. He gets his hands in it and mixes it all up. It's all good stuff. All you need to do is get what we're doing today. We've got some mackerel. We've got some of the coarse fishing scents that we pour in on top. Mixed up mackerel. Put it, put it all into an onion bag. You can get plenty of those from the uh, green grocers. And then when we're settled down and anchored, we should, we should just drop that over the side and then we're ready. And what, what happens is that this runs a nice scent all the way down the line, all the way down along the seabed and attracts a fish. Right, we've got the um, anchor down, so the, the next important job is to get that rubby dubby bag over the side. We note how many lead weights we've got hung on there. That's to counteract the tie because we want that to hang right down on the bottom. And the idea, of course, is that when it's down on the bottom, it will lay there and all that lovely smell and juices, it'll all go down on the tide, 100, 200, 300 yards. And anything that's in its way, hopefully, will come back up and find air baits. It does, a, it does unfortunately attract uh, quite a lot of small fish when you do that, but you have to put up with that, especially the small dogfish that tear the baits to pieces. If you keep checking the bait, it's no problem, provided you've got plenty of bait, of course. Right, well, there we are. Preparations are all made. Rubby dub is over. Got some bait. The line's in the water. Well, we're fishing for ray today, and we're in Start Bay, and as you can see behind me is Start Point. That lighthouse is quite famous. And we're on the western end of the Skerries Banks. Now, that's out from Dartmouth. And we left there this morning, came down the river, 
out here. The banks are about five miles long. The Bell Boy is down that way, east of where we are now, almost five miles away. We're right off the end of the bank and we're on a, a pit on the end where there's a bit of rough ground. And this is where the ray seems to lie. First fish of the day, the inevitable dogfish. Well, the method we're using today is down tide fishing. That's dropping the baits and the weights over the stern or over the side and just working them back astern of the boat. The other method which we could use would be up tiding. That's casting up to the bow of the boat and letting the boat line bow around. But the depth of water is really too great for that where we're fishing today. So we're concentrating on down tiding and the rods that I've chosen to use, I've got one that's eight foot because I quite like using that. It's quite a powerful rod and gives me the opportunity of keeping away from other people. The, my other rod is a 20 pound rod and that's a six foot six. I much prefer to use the longer rod really, but this is quite powerful. It's a carbon rod and it's a 20 pound tip. So hopefully if I get one of the bigger ray later in the day, it'll cope with that adequately. Multipliers, you don't need to be too big, not for the ray that we're catching in this particular area. I've got a 7,000 and a 6,600. Both are adequate. One is loaded with 30 pound line and the other is loaded with 20. Well, it might seem a bit odd that I've got 35 pound line on one reel and 20 pound on the other, but that's in case we go on to the ray pit in which there's some really big blonde ray, then I will only use the one reel and rod with a heavier line on. Great, Pat. Well done, mate. So, what do you reckon that one is, Pat? Ten? Ten, yeah. Yeah. Nine, so, ten, bang. I would have thought so. Gives us the opportunity now, of course, to have a quick look at the blonde ray. As we said, it's not a great big one, but it's around about ten pound. Well, now's a good opportunity to have a look at the blonde ray, because identification for some people is a problem. But there shouldn't be a problem. You can see they've got fairly uniform spots all over. You've got more or less only two sizes, the bigger one and the smaller one there. And you've got these little white blotches, which are fairly uniform all over the, the ray. The spines up come up the tail, but they stop about at the top there, just about there. But the easy way to tell is the only ray that has the spots which go right out to the wing edges, which you can see there. On all other rays, they tend to stop with about an inch border, at least, all round. Because the rays live on the bottom, they have difficulty in breathing when they're laying flat, of course. So they have these spiracles on top of the head, which are behind the eyes, which 
they suck in air and water, or water rather, through there. And you can see how they close, open and close. And we can just see how big that is, what happens. That comes out, it's almost telescopic really, when it's, when it's laying on the bottom and feeding. That opens out and it sucks the food right inside. And they don't have teeth as such, perhaps like the sharks. Uh, they, although they are teeth, they're very close together, more like grinders. And you mustn't put your hand or finger in there because they really do some damage and it's not easy to get out. Well, there's one other thing you might like to know about the uh, skates and the rays, and that's they classified as a, a rain fish and not a flat fish. And that's because they're flattened downwards from top to bottom, unlike the flounders in the place which are flattened sideways. And the huge disc, or the wing of the skate, is its pectoral fins. And they, over, over the years, that's how that's evolved. And that's the way that they sort of fly through the water. That's their propellant. And the dorsal fin is right on the tip of the tail. Now, that's quite unusual. But those two little fins on this particular species is a dorsal fin. Okay. So, Pat, we're going to pull him back. Yeah. Do you normally put all your fish back? Put a lot back. Um, if we can't eat them, or well, we're not going to eat them, put them back. It's, it's, it makes a lot of sense, really, doesn't it? Because fish are scarce now. Well, yeah, somebody can have perhaps ten anglers can catch on over the next few years. So, one more for them. Doesn't seem to affect them either, does it? They no. swim away quite happily. Yeah. Yep. That's right. right. Let's OK, step him back. Yep. Conservation is very important. But when you're ray fishing, I don't think it's important to hold your rod. In fact, I think it's more important to lean it against the gunnel because a skate or a ray doesn't pick up your bait and run like another fish. Therefore, you don't need to strike. In fact, quite often when the ray settles on your bait, the wing of the fish can touch your line and that can give you a false bite. You strike and you've lost the fish or maybe just foul hooked it. So, leave it there. When you've seen the bite, then pick the rod up, hold it and wait till you know the fish is there and strike. But you have to be very careful when you do this, otherwise you're going to lose your rod and perhaps 150 pounds worth of equipment. So when you lean it against the gunnel, make sure you've got enough weight inside to hold it down and more important, make sure that the drag is loose and the ratchet is on so that if a skate or a ray picks it up and runs off, only the line leaves the reel. Your rod stays in the boat. Because unfortunately you've got to fish your way through the dogfish until you get to the ray. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's handy, isn't it? Yes, I Spotted. Like that's a beauty, that, isn't it? Beautiful. Well done. Yeah. That's, That's a pretty one. As you can now see the difference, this is not uh, a blonde ray, although it's a spotted one. This is a spotted ray. It's one of the smaller of the ray family. You can see on this one how the spots vary. Spots are more of a uniform size. There's none of the little, little spots. There are the blodges, but not all the, like they were on the other one in uniform size and the spots do not go out to the edges. You've got this half inch border all the way around. And on the spotted ray, you've got some little hooks and there and there, and there's a few on the edges just here. It's a bit much more rough there than it is on the blonde ray. Right, as I said, it's a small fish, but we've just weighed it. And would you believe it's over five pound? In fact, on the spring balance, which is banks and about, it's between five and a quarter and five and a half. And the specimen fish in this area is five and a half pounds. So this one's going to be kept and taken home and weighed properly. So hopefully that will become a specimen and an NFSA medal for Keith. And of course, it will make a nice meal tomorrow. Some nice wings on that one. You haven't got another one there, Keith, have you? Looks like hey? it. Hey? Well like done. It. Well done. Good job we brought you today. <laughs> oh, that's looking good, isn't it? Yeah. He's holding down and 
Hold him down the tide, isn't he? Ooh, yeah. yeah. Come on, no, it's a dog. You got us fooled there, didn't you? I did, I had me fooled. And you? Well. Oh. Hey. <laughs> hey, you don't know the difference, no? no not the difference, I've caught too many. <laughs> Never mind. I must admit, he was pulling down well. Yeah. They're bait robbers, aren't they? They are. Really are. Well, everybody else has got their lines in the water, so it gives me an opportunity of showing you the tackle that we're using and tackle that you might like to use if you get the opportunity to go ray fishing. So, first of all, let's just have a look at a straightforward rig. It's made up with heavy nylon. It's done so that you can see the way to rig up. I'll tell you the weights that you ought to be using, so don't take any notice of the thickness of the nylon. Now, on the end of the, your line, the first thing you want to do is slip on a boom, similar to this. And you must have the weight clip nearest the rod tip when you thread it on. And as you can see, that holds it out and makes a nice little boom in the trace for you. On the end of that, you clip your weight, of course, using the one that's suitable for the conditions to which you're going to fish. We're going to be using weights of up to a pound today. Now, the next thing after the, your boom, you slip on a bead. Now, that only acts as a buffer between the boom and your swivel, which in this case is a link swivel. I, I always use those, so that if I change the traces, which I do frequently during the day, either shorter, or longer, or lighter, lighter nylon, uh, I can just clip it on. So there you have your swivel and your trace, which can be any length really. Uh, I quite like to use them 8, 10, 12 feet sometimes, and I've seen anglers use them up to 15, but 8 to 10 feet seems to suit my type of fishing and most people. So you have one long trace and on the end a hook. Now you have to use the size which really equates to the type of bait you're using. So let's have a look at uh, one or two styles of hook. Well the stainless steel hook is used by many anglers. A bit thick in the, bit thick in the shank. Sometimes they're not quite as sharp as they ought to be but you can always hone them up. They're very strong of course and you don't always have to use one quite as big as you would if you use one of the wire hooks. That's a good old O'Shaughnessy type hook that we've used for many years. One of probably 4.0 or 6.0 you probably want to use if you're using those but the bigger the hook the, th the thicker the shank usually gets. Although there are many on the market now that are uh, a lot uh, thinner and a lot stronger and Cox and Rule produce some very good hooks, very suitable for this type of fishing. The Aberdeen style hook is particularly good, I feel, for using eels because I think they're quite light and they don't detract from the swimming action of the sand eel when it's in the water. If you have one of the bigger and thicker hooks, I think it tends to pull the head of the eel down and it doesn't swim in the natural uh, precision. Well that's just a selection of hooks really. Yeah, there are dozens, I suppose hundreds of hooks when you go into a shop so the choice is great and it's really down to the, the ones that you prefer. So make sure you choose one that's suitable for the type of fishing you're going to do but more important make sure that it will carry the bait that you want to use. Uh, without being masked. So, I mean, so I've seen people put on great chunks of mackerel onto small hooks and there's no way if you get a bite the fish is going to latch onto the hook because the point of the hook is buried in the bait. You've got to make sure the point of the hook is clear of the bait otherwise it's not going to do its job. One popular lead with anglers, especially in this part of the world, me in particular, is the old standby grip lead. You know the round one with a hole through the middle and little bubbles all around both sides of it. Really hugs the bottom that one. I find them extremely good. They come in all sizes from about two ounces right through to a pound. Well some anglers like to use what you might call 
the casting lead. In my younger days, we called it a torpedo lead. But it's still very successful and it does its job extremely well. Well, that's just a small selection of leads. Again, it's uh, using what you prefer. I mean, there, there are many other different types that are used around the country, but it's a personal choice and that's what fishing is all about. Most anglers who tie a hook usually tie it with a half blood. They just put it, they, they just put the uh, nylon through the loop and tie the knot. Now, I don't particularly like that because I feel that that's a weak point. I have seen eyes partly open Sometimes they're badly manufactured and there's a gap. And I feel that that line could come out of there. So I never tie mine that way. I tie mine like a, I would tie a spade end hook. And I find that that works extremely well. And I'll show you the, one of the other reasons I use it when I've tied it. So all you do first is put your line through the eye. Now take your loose end, make a loop on the shank and then with the loose end wind it around the loop and the shank four or five times holding it with your finger taking the loose end passing it through the loop if you're in the boy scouts they used to say put the rabbit down the hole pull the whole thing up tight holding this loose end with your thumb and finger and then it pulls up as you can see in neat coils. Snip off and there you have a neatly tied hook with all the strength under the eye so that it pulls up against the eye when you've got a big fish on. Now the other reason that I like to use that particular knot is if I put that hook on my finger you will see that as I pull it's not a direct pull it's pulling the hook at an angle so when I strike or pull the hook or the point of the hook must be going into to the fish's mouth it's not pulling straight out again and I feel that because I'm not on a direct pull that way I'm always pulling the hook into the fish Just move that knife. Big dog. No, it's a skate. Another spotty, I think, yeah. Well done, Keith. You're leading the way today. <laughs> Another spotty. It's worth noting on this one that this is not a female, this is a male, and as you can see they've got two long claspers. And there's a little warning for you, don't get hold of them and pick it up because inside is, is it's very sharp and it really cut well into your hands. So keep your hands well away from that when you're handling your fish or picking them up. Right, I'm going to take the hook out and we're just dropping back over the side I think, Keith. Yeah. Pretty fish, aren't they? They are, super fish. You manage? Yeah. They like the sand hills, don't they? They do indeed. If you want to work your bait back away from the boat, especially when the tide is as strong as it is today, it's quite easy. All you need to do is just lift the rod, just release your spool and let it bump down again. Take it up, let it swing back up in the tide, let the tide pick it up, release the spool and it bumps down again a few yards back take up the strain and you keep doing that until you're back as far as you feel you ought to be or until you've got an actual angle and the weight you've got on will hold bottom without swinging up in the tide if you have it too close to the boat it's like an anchor really if you don't have enough warp out you won't hold and this is the same principle when you're fishing the bait will swim up off the bottom if you don't don't have it far enough back It's nice to see this year that there's more basking shark coming around. 
what we're looking at now is, is a small one. You can see the fin and the tail not too far apart. That, that was probably only about 12 to 15 feet. Not much more than a baby. But how nice to see them. But don't forget the Marine Conservation Society would like us all to uh, report every one we see. So if you see one, get in touch and tell them where you saw it and the day you saw it. Feel better, Keith? It does a little bit better, yeah. I think you've got the magic touch today. <laughs> I heard whispers just now about somebody having to walk home. <laughs> I think it's me. <laughs> Bull hus, big bull hus. That's great. That's a different doggy. All these so hey. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's a bonus. Un unexpected, isn't it? It is, huh? Middle of the day. Yeah. Don't see that many, not down this part of the world, do we? It's a strong fish. Aren't they strong? Yeah. Pat, you got the hook. This is about a medium sized fish. It's, it's not uh, into double figures. But it uh, gives me the opportunity perhaps just to show you how you can tell the difference on a small bull hus. If you look at the anal fins here, you will notice that, that a second dorsal fin, if you take it a line from there, it'll cut that one right in the middle. That's quite a good way telling the difference between a bull hus and a lesser spotted because on the lesser spotted that second dorsal is back so that the front of it cuts down the back of this one. I'll show you that in a minute when we get another lesser spotted in the boat. It's just that little bit of difference and it's a positive way of identifying the two. There you've got the nose flash. You don't get these on the lesser spotted dogfish. Eight ish. Nine pounds. Nine pounds on him. Take it over. As you can see on the lesser spotted dogfish, there, there is a difference. The front of the second dorsal is, in fact, right in line with the back of the pelvic fin. So you can see it's a, it is a simple and easy way to tell the difference. <laughs> Waiting this time. Amazing. It's amazing isn't it? We moved to the deeper pit where the big ray might be, put on half a fillet of mackerel and just look at the size of the whiting. Quite incredible. Unfortunately, in this deep water, it's no good putting them back. They won't survive. So that'll have to be tea.
Thank you, Tom. You're kind. Thank you. You're lucky fluids on that one, eh? If you're going after skate, you've got to remember it's a really big fish. It has a lot of weight. You're going to catch skate that are well in excess of 100 pounds. And being a flat type fish, it's going to be able to hug the bottom and it's going to take some lifting and breaking off. So you're going to actually need some robust gear. So forget light lining because that, I'm afraid, for skate fishing has to go out the window. So what am I going to be using in Clue Bay? Well, one of the rods will be this one. That's a 50 pound Tesco. Got a good reel, a good solid multiplier. This one's loaded with 40 pound line. And we go through to a robust trace. I think I'll be able to get away with about an eight ounce lead. There's not a great deal of tide here. The normal boom that we use for fishing, which just holds the trace out. The bead is your buffer between the, the boom and the swivel. Good robust swivel. The top of the trace is going to be heavy nylon, so crimp it. And I like to use two crimps, sort of belt and braces job this. If you uh, knot it, you get a rather big lump there and that picks up weed and it causes ripple on the tide and disturbance, I fancy. Now the reason we're using this heavy nylon is because the skate has a very long tail and a rough back. And if it brings that tail up and the spines chafe it, you're going to lose the fish. So heavy nylon, 150 to 200 pound is favourites. On the end, you have a wire trace. So again, it needs to be joined with a good, solid, robust swivel. Double crimped for safety. Anything 18 inches to two foot of wire. This one's 250 pound, a nice soft cable lay. It's not likely to kink up and a good size hook. 8.0 to 10.0, because remember you're going to be using big baits, that's whole mackerel and pieces of dogfish. We got a, I presume, a lesser spot of dogfish is by all accounts there's hundreds and thousands of these out here. You can steal your bait all day long. And that's what it is. No, nope, a little tiny spur dog. And that, I can't see with my glass. No, it's a little lesser spotted dogfish. Rain on my glasses. Much the same as we get at home, but about the same size, bait robbers. Right, we shall have to cut that hook off, I think. Yeah, well, that's the first run of the day, but we're not quite sure whether it's a skate or not. I'm going to give it a few minutes to settle on the bait in case he was just running off with it. But there's something there digging in. Yeah, yes, yes. We're into whatever it is. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. We're almost certain that that was a taupe. Yeah, as you can see the see the teeth marks there. Look, right where he had all of it. 
and he oh he's only just missed the hook. Right, great job, thank you. Right. Your magic touch this time, Tom. <laughs> I'll put the last one on. Make out this one at all. It's uh, one minute he's gone, the next minute he's not. Well, I don't quite know what happened there, but he's didn't take it like the last one. It's biting short. You see, we put the hook further down. It's just been getting over the tail. Yeah. See if we can do something about that. I wonder if we could put, perhaps put on a smaller bait. Well, what I've done now, I want this tope. He's had a couple of goes at the whole mackerel and he's been just taking it and running and missing the hook. So I'm going to give it a try like that. We've cut, cut a mackerel in half this time. Got the hook just short. Let me give that a try and see if, that, if he's sort of being playful and he's not really hungry. We'll see how that goes. Let's see if we can fool him with that. Too quickly. Unfortunately, we're on slack water at the moment, and uh, that's always a problem because it doesn't hold the bait away from the line, and if not careful, it will all get tangled up. So it's a case of just letting it down slowly. It takes a little bit longer, but we've got, we've got all day. <coughs> not what we're looking for. It's not, a, not one of the big skate, that's for sure, but something different than that. The dogfish we've been pestered with. I suppose it could be a full ass. It might even be a thorn back, but I think it's probably a full ass. I don't know. I can tell. Oh, it's a full ass. Can you do that, Mum? Right. Got your net? Right. Oh, I'll put the ring on the net. Beauties of fishing up in Ireland and Coo Bay in particular, that you really don't know what you're going to catch. Well, we've had two tote runs this morning, numerous uh, sort of lesser spotted dogfish, and now we've got a bull ass. Coo Bay has it all, I think. Even with even in this weather. Sun's coming out. The tide is almost beginning to run, so it won't be long now. And I think we've got another bull ass here. I think so. Yep. Oh no! Thornback skate. There's that. Oh, lovely. Thornback. Ah, oh, little thornback. By golly, look at that. Old mackerel. They never believe this back in South Devon. <laughs> Look at that, old mackerel. And a little little thornback. I really can't believe that 
that little thorn back has taken that whole mackerel. I can't believe, I really can't believe that he took that, the whole mackerel. Look at the size of the hook. Quite, quite incredible. They're not going to believe it when they see this. Well, it's not very big as the thorn back goes. I suppose that one, in fact, that one's not sizable. They've got to be, in England anyway, they've got to be 16 inches across the wing to keep it. And that one is not, I wouldn't think, nine. No, it's not quite that one. Well, that intrigues me. I'm not quite sure what all that black is on his nose there. Right, well, we've just put him back. I want to keep him flat in the water, but I don't want to use a cloth and get all the slime off the fish. But you have to be careful of these tail. Very, very spiny. So I just hold it up. Don't catch hold of it so that it slides through your fingers at any time because, my goodness me, that'll rip your fingers to pieces. Come on, beauty. Away you go. The other way up. There he goes. Look at that. Graceful, isn't it? Isn't that graceful? It's like a bird. Oh, we've got the lines down again. Well, I noticed just before I put that ray back, you measured it. What, what reason did you measure it? Well, we usually tag them. We tag a lot of the ray for the fishery board so they can keep tracks of like where they end up. And they send us back a record then at the end of the year and they tell us if they've been caught before. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's good crack. Yes. You learn, and you know, like for their movements and everything. Yeah, I was going to say, do, do you find that many of the fish you tag are caught in Clue Bay again or have some of them moved further away? A lot of them, a lot of them move out of Clue Bay. We've never caught one of the ones we've tagged like that before. We've caught the big skate, all right, but not the small ones. What reason, is there any other reason that the fisheries want to tag them? Is, are they just trying to conserve the species or are they just trying to work out the movements? Just work out the movements and conservation mm. and all that, as far as I know. Mm. How many different species do they tag or how many do you tag? Well, I usually tag mostly thornbacks. We tag the common skate and uh, any other fish that they want. You're quite, quite a conservationist, really, then. Yeah, it's I don't good. like killing them. No, no, no. Are most of the skippers like that over here? Yeah, Tra char most, charter most skippers. Of them like that. Mm. Most of them. That's good, isn't it? That's, it's good fun, like. Yeah. It's nice to see the fish come back alive. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Coming up through the water, and then I can't. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. Look at that. Shark again. Tope again, I should think. What do you reckon that? Yeah. Or is that a skate? Yeah. It's more like a skate, man. It looks like a big skate, doesn't it? Hold. Oh. Catch him yet, sir, we'll have him yet. I don't think this is a big skate we've been looking for, but certainly more beef to this one. He's coming up too easy, really. There's a bit of pull there. I'm not quite sure. It's not even like a running tope, so I'm not really quite sure what's happening to this. Straight up and down. The trouble is, oh, I think it's a big bull ass. I think I can feel a tail or something. Bang in the line! It's a taupe. It's a taupe. Oh, I wonder that's the one that's been after us all day, pinching our bait. I get yet. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Tag the fish. You can not just note there. It just goes straight in the dorsal fin and it misses. <laughs> it's, that's right, lovely. This one is Fisheries Board Ireland and it says on there that you actually get a reward. You just notice that the tail is different on the tope. It's, um, it's the only one that I know of for the shark family. It's got a complete notch out there. It's unmistakable. This is a, of course, a male tope. I'm not quite sure what the weight of this is. My best one many years ago 
was £49 a male, but this one wouldn't go that. I suspect this one, what, 30-ish? 20, 25 to 30, this one, yeah. That's, uh, 59 inches, yes, correct? See, the thing is, when we put tote back these days, we, we don't want to hang them up and weigh them. They get in, pardon? 20. 20. It's much better just to measure them, and then we can slip them back over the side again. On well, these days of conservation and trying to preserve the species, especially tote, we don't want to damage the tote more than we have to, so they're only measured. We don't hang them up and weigh them or anything. There's no point, really. We know what it is. We've caught it. So we'll just get the hook out, and we'll just drop him back overboard again. Right, come on then, my beauty. Away we go. Let's just put you down in there. Oh, I'll just hold him by the tail first till he gets his strength up. Right, I think we're all right. And away he goes. Yeah, he's all right. Yeah, there he goes. Look at that. Oh, lovely. You can just see him going. Oh, it's nice. It's lovely, isn't it, when they swim away like that? I think part of the joy of fishing I think is to, to let them go again and don't really want to kill them what good is it really you can't eat them well some people do but uh, not really they're much nicer back into their, their own element and of course tope are quite scarce I mean when I was younger it just shows how old I am we could go out and catch up to six a night off the shore and as I said my biggest male tote was uh, 49 pounds and that was off the shore but I'm afraid those days are gone and that's one of the reasons why we need to put, so put the tote back and I think it's all credit to the Irish fisheries that they're actually doing this scheme where they tag the fish and put them back. It'd be jolly interesting to see where that one ends up. I know when they had some tagging in England many years ago there was some tope that actually swam if I remember correctly up to 4,000 miles. Some have gone down into the Med and one or two odd ones have actually cro crossed the Atlantic. I think that's quite incredible. They're a wide-ranging species of fish. Anyway, we're, we're here to try and catch some skate, so I was going to get the bait back in the water, I think. I don't know what we got. Probably another dog, I think, a us or something. It's starting to shake a bit there. It's a long fish. It's a oh, big bullass. Can you deal with that one, Thomas, please? Thank you. Yeah. And yet another duck, another bullass. Oh, he's nice and neatly hooked. Yeah, another one. It's about seven or eight pound, I suppose, that one. It's, um, do you want to tag him? You, do, you don't tag, though. <laughs> there's, there's enough of those there, aren't there? Yeah, it's good. That's yeah. Oh, lovely. Well done. Yeah, I thought I liked that. That's, that's very sensible. That's very, very slow and difficult. Is, how difficult is it now? You know, have they? Did it completely disappear from Clue Bay? No, I'd say this year, Ted, there's been about nine or ten of them caught already this year. But it's slow fishing. Skate fishing, you need a lot of patience. Yeah. You know? But otherwise, they are there. Anybody that wants to come and have a go for the skate, how many days do they sort of want to allocate to come and just come out and sit? I mean, I've spent two days out here now, and mm. we've had tope and everything else, but we haven't yet had a, a skate. Yeah, Not long enough? No, I'll tell you the way I look at it, you can come out and you can be here for two hours. 
and you can be lucky enough to catch your skate, you know. Yeah. You can come out another time, you might be here for a week and get nothing, you know. Mm. It's very much uh, hit and miss, you know. So there's no disgrace if anybody comes out and they can't catch one, Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's no disgrace. <laughs> and at the... How many of the locals we catch? I mean, you've had one this year. How many? Did you get um, one last year? No, I got none last year. But two of my clubmates got one. Got one some last year. Um, two, four weeks ago, I got my one, and there was two caught that day. Within yeah. a hundred yards of one another. You know, that's the Wait, uh, the well, look of the. Yeah. Because a few years back, there used to be a lot of skate here, didn't there? Oh, this bay was alive and said back, say twenty years ago. Mm. They were overfished at the time. There was no conservation. Killed everything to wear them in, yeah. you know. That's one good point about the Irish Fisheries Board, isn't it? They they're very conservation conscious. They are, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, I think they learned the hard way. You know, people thought there was an endless supply of those fish. Mm. Like a skate can be what a hundred years old, and you can kill them in what an hour. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't make sense. I know we're looking for the big skate, but uh, it does take a long time. You've got to sit it out. Well, it's nice to see other fish coming up. And I suppose this is the next best thing after a, a lesser spotted dogfish. Anyway, we're putting him back to survive again. So, come on then. Right, Biddy. Away you go. Whoa, yes. Didn't waste much time on that. And another one goes back. Oh, great day. Let's get some more bait on. It's amazing, really. The size of fish they take. Look at that. That's all that's left of the whole mackerel. Amazing. Well, that's all that's left. That was a whole mackerel, just with the backbone taken out. Oh well, put another one on. Good job we got plenty of mackerel here today for bait. There's one thing that when I'm fishing and holding my line that I always do. I tend to hold the line down with my finger and let the line go across the ball of my thumb. And that way it seems to pull on your thumb and you can feel every movement. Oh, yes. That's better. I should think this is probably... Oh, I don't know, it's taupe, I should think, that one. Oh, yes, another taupe, I think, this one. It's coming up. But that's very unusual. All the taupe I've caught, in, certainly in England, I suppose it's because it's been in shallower water. But, but they've always run these stay terribly deep. And you're playing right under, literally under the hull of the boat all the time. Oh. Right under the boat now, I've got to watch the prop. He's doing everything but doing what I expected him to do. Oh, he's coming up, Michael. Uh, oh. Yeah, it's a tote. Oh, right enough, he's got the other line. You want to get in front of me, Tom? Ah, oh, great. Well done, Tom, thank you. Pressed himself up, got the other line. All right, come there. Come, come, come. Come, come. Right. Yeah, got this one. Got him. Another male. You want to measure him as well. And then we can get that hook out, can we, or not? Easy. Do the tag in first. Right. No, he's more than... Oh, 50, 59 and a half, uh, Tom. It's about half an inch bigger than the other one, I think. Yeah, yeah great. Lovely. Right, we get the hook out and we put, her, put him back. Right. You can go back into the deep again. Just lowering down gently. 
head first, hold his tail, make, whoop, make sure he's all right. I think he's going to be all right. Right, away. oh yeah, there's some strength there. Where you go then? Oh, he's gone. Right round there. Oh, he's swimming round the side here. There he goes. Oh. Yeah, he's staying. Oh, he's gone a long way off there before he's gone down. Very unusual. Right. right. Excitement, excitement, excitement. Great. That's what I think fishing's all about. You never know what's coming up next. Come out to get a skate and we finish up with Tope and Bullas and Storm Back Ray. No, no skate yet. Still time. Ah, still time. Oh, I think we need to put another trace on there. Oh my god, he made a mess of that. Look at that. Right. <laughs>